Good morning again. It is uh, also my joy this morning to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Phil Arms. Phil gave his life to Jesus Christ in 1972 and was licensed to preach the gospel in a local Southern Baptist church and then commissioned as an evangelist. His interdenominational ministry held weekend rallies geared toward the youth for many years, later adding television and radio ministries and also numerous church revivals, area-wide campaigns, where Phil always focused on preaching a Bible-centered, Christ-exalting message. And after spending 15 years in the ministry as a full-time evangelist, uh, Phil and his wife Suzanne felt God strongly urging them to start a local church in the Houston area. So in 1986, and for 14 years following, he witnessed a continual powerful move of the Spirit of God as it touched thousands of lives and their homes. Well, since the year 2000, Dr. Arms has devoted much of his time to writing, uh, speaking at Bible conferences, and in churches, as well as, con as a contributing guest on radio programs. Phil has also co-authored several best-selling books with uh, authors such as Tim LaHaye. And these books include Earth's Final Days, uh, The Triumphant Return of Christ, and Piercing the Darkness. He has also written for Promise Keepers, Another Trojan Horse, <laughs> Wet Flies Can't Fly, The Winner in You, and Pokemon and Harry Potter, A Fatal Attraction. Phil and Suzanne have a son, two married daughters, and two grandchildren. My brothers and sisters, oh, let's give him a warm Believer's Fellowship welcome, Dr. Phil Arms. Thank, Thank you, Lenny. I want to hear that guy. <laughs> I don't remember him. Well, good morning. Good morning. And uh, I'm sorry if you came to hear Joe Arms preach this morning. It's a letdown for you, I know, but we'll make do this morning. It's good to see so many of my old friends and a few of my enemies here this morning. <laughs> Some of my board members, Frank Dvorak and David Turquik, and I can't see how many others are here because the light's blinding me. But, and then I came in this morning and was surprised to see my mother and uh, long-gone sister, Camille, here today. It was a great surprise. And I hate to preach. It's kind of like preaching in front of Jesus when you're preaching in front of my mother. So it's a bit intimidating, and uh, perhaps we'll get through it. If you got your Bible. You got a Bible? Say amen. amen. Well, I don't know if you can read it in here, but if you can... I'm going to read out of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 in a moment. And to Joe, I would say, uh, God bless you. He's, uh, this, this church, of course, has been around long enough to have a reputation now that God is obviously using you and you've sent light in his word around the world and done so in high fashion. Uh, Joe is one that I am proud of beyond words. I think he's uh, a great man of God. You are most blessed and fortunate to have him in this pulpit every, every uh, week. There are plenty of places that would much rather uh, have him in their place than this place. And so you're, you're fortunate and blessed of God to be a part of that. And I'm sure that he would applaud you today for all that you mean to him as well. So I will attempt to give you God's word today and pray that you will receive it in the spirit in which it is delivered, the Holy Spirit. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm excited. I'm excited. Oh, come on now. Turn to the person on the other side then. If you didn't like them, tell them you're excited. <laughs> okay. I want to read a, a passage here out of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 
as soon as I get my old people eyes on. Examine yourselves. Nobody likes to do that. Whether you are in the faith, prove yourselves. Know you not yourselves how Jesus Christ is in you, unless, of course, you'll be a, a reprobate. Paul writes this letter to the Corinthian church, several of which three had written, two we have in the scriptures. And they are at a place as a church, you know, a lot of church members get to the place in spiritual growth, I guess they consider it growth, where they start knowing more than the preacher. In fact, knowing more than anybody. And begin to uh, instruct from the pew the things that ought to be done from the pulpit. Well, this is the condition in which Paul finds himself is as he's continuing to deal with this church that he planted and grew up. And they were questioning his authority. In fact, in verse 3 of that same chapter, he said, Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, you want to know what he says, then listen well. And he continues to explain to them why he is where he is and why they are where they are and what God's expectations of them are. But he says, first, more important. And this is the most important thing that any of us have to deal with today. And that is, do I know I'm saved? Now I could ask the question that I do in a lot of churches and everybody would raise their hands. Of course I know I'm saved. I'm in church, aren't I? I'm saved. I know Jesus. Doesn't matter how I live, but I'm a Christian. The fact is there are many in our church. In fact, there's many years ago, Billy Graham wrote, and he said, I believe about 75 or 85 percent of the people in Southern Baptist churches have never met Christ. And someone asked him why, and he said, he said, because they've got too much trouble following Jesus. And Paul says, you better, you better make sure, look to your life. Make sure you're born again. And he says, prove that. Oh, not prove anything to anybody. Yes, you do. The Bible says prove. Now, the word there is really test as much as it is prove. He says, you test it. You look at your life under the microscope. He says, well, how, what's the standard by which I'm to compare my life to say, say whether I'm really saved or not? It is the word of God. That is the acid test that you must look at of whether you're saved or not. It's not something you do. It's what God has done in your life, if anything. It will manifest itself in a way that people look at you and they can see that you aren't you. They can see that you are Christ and they identify your life much more with Christ than they do with you. That's what becoming a Christian is. It's becoming Christ's life. It's not you trying to do better. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's not qu quitting cussing and smoking and chewing and going with the girls that are doing. It's you putting on Christ. It's dying to those things which I want to do and how I want to live, and it's putting Christ in the driver's seat. And he says, you better make sure that you've done that. How do you do that? You look at the Word. What does the Word of God say happens what does the Word of God say a Christian looks like? What happens? What transpires to make? And the Bible says in James that the Word of God is like a mirror. How many of you got up this morning and looked in the mirror? Yeah. You should have if you didn't. Look. <laughs> you look in the mirror in the morning when you get up and you don't look quite like you'd like to look. Your hair's all ruffled up and you're Breath stinks and your, your eyes are kind of puffy and crossed and no telling what else is wrong with some of you, but you don't particularly like the way you look and you think, well, you know, if I'm going to go out in public, if I'm going to go to church, I need to fix myself. And the mirror tells you what you ought to fix. And the Bible says in James that when you look in the mirror, don't forget what you see. Look at what you see and remember what you see and do something about it. It's not this attitude that says, well, you know, I'm a Christian and I'm doing the best I can. No, you're not doing the best you can. Nobody does the best they can. And best you can isn't enough anyway. Look in the mirror. Look in the Word of God. Look at your life. See where you stand. Find out even first, he says, if you're really, really born again, really if you're not a reprobate. Ask yourself this question. Is there anything different between me and lost people? 
there anything different between me and people who don't proclaim Christ as Lord? Tragically, many lives of church people are not, they're synonymous with the lost. They're, they're just like those to whom they have, have said they, we have come out among from, that we are different, but they're not different. It's very simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13 says, or 17, when I became a Christian, when I took on Christ, it says, old things pass away, right? And all things become new. Everything's new. How do you know if Jesus has been around? He changes everything he touches. If he's touched your life, he did not leave you the same way before you were before he touched your life. You're new. Some of you sit here today and you look at your life and you look, you're like you've always been. You've never been any different than you are now. Then you're not a Christian. Because when he comes in, he brings new attitudes, new convictions, new feelings about sin, new ceilings about holiness, new understanding of the world around you. All things pass away, all things become new, and it's so new that when the world looks at you, they think you're crazy. In fact, in the 60s and 70s, many of you all, maybe you remember the term Jesus freak. In fact, in the Times Magazine and Newsweek Magazine had big articles and spreads on the Jesus movement and all the Jesus freaks. And that became a term for the world to use, Jesus freaks. That's why, in fact, I was on a television program. You go into these crusade revivals, and they have you on the little local TV station, you know, and I was on one of those early on in the 70s. A very erudite, sophisticated woman was the host, and she comes on and sits down, and the lights come up, and the cameras come on, and she says, well, we have a little preacher with us today. Are you one of those Jesus freaks? And I said, no, ma'am, Jesus doesn't make people into freaks. He makes freaks into people. And that's the change that only Jesus can bring about. It's not a change of me trying to be a better person, reforming myself. It is a change that is brought by supernatural transaction that when you say, I die, he lives. Now, now, that's not the message being heard today, especially on Christian television and most churches, pulpits today. Their, their, their message is, well, come on down the aisle and say the prayer. Say the prayer, join the church, believe the right stuff, acknowledge Christ as Lord. That doesn't mean he's your Lord. Acknowledge him as your Savior, your life. For this purpose, I live. Christ only. We got instant, uh, instant Christian. We got, you take instant tea and you put it in a little glass of cold water and you stir it up and you've got tea, instant tea. Got instant coffee. You take coffee, you put it in a little cup of hot water, coffee, got instant coffee. We take little pagans in our church and we stick them in the baptistry and stir them up and say, we got a Christian. <laughs> They're not Christians. They're just replicas of themselves that got wet. Jesus makes a change. You know, this is the probably out of the 500 years I've been preaching, this is probably one of the most spectacular, amazing things to me that I ever discovered, that people can go through this experience of new birth and then say, unchanged, like I am, I'm a Christian. You're not a Christian. until Christ comes in and changes the very nature and the very fiber of who you are, what you are, where you're going, and what you want. You're different. But this casual Christianity, it's like I was walking into a 7-Eleven some years ago when a girl was standing there on the side of the building and she was smoking a joint, had a bottle and a paper bag in her head, sharing each toke on that as she went along and talking about her, or laying there. She actually she was waiting for customers. She was a hooker. And she was dressed in a way that you couldn't tell whether she's out getting in or in getting out. You know, everything was out. And she, uh, 
Looked up when I passed and I gave her a track. I said, you know, God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. Are you a Christian? And she said, what makes you think I'm not? The question is, what makes you think you are? Well, I'm trying to be, I'm really trying to be. It's like trying to be a chicken. You're not going to make it. <laughs> Legs, sprout, feathers, doesn't matter. You're not a chicken. You're never going to be a chicken. You can try till you die. You ain't going to make it. Nor will you able to be a Christian. Well, every time I try, everything just falls apart and I, I have so many problems. Well, of course you have problems when you get right with God. You're, you're not signing up for Sunday school. You're signing up for war. Amen. We're in a battle. And that war rages not only in the world around us, it is always attempting on every turn to seduce us through our music, through our television, through our radio. Everything is set up to seduce us and to believe in the lie. And unfortunately, so many are rolling with the punches and giving themselves over to the idea that, well, you know, now I've made my commitment to Jesus. Now I can just go out and do what... Listen, I was in a pizza place some time ago and there was, uh, we were sitting down and behind us there were three or four, or five or six young people and they were cussing up a storm and drinking beer and having a big party in time. And I just walked by and left a track on the table and said, uh, y'all... Y'all, God loves you. Just wanted to have this little piece of information for you there, if you know it. And you become a Christian, life changes. And one girl stood up. She said, oh, I'm a Christian. One of the beer drinkers. I'm a Christian. I said, do me a favor. Don't tell anybody. Please. There is a testimony to be protected here. Don't insult the integrity of intelligence or the integrity of the Word of God and tell people, well, I'm a Christian and live like hell. Amen. Amen. It does not exist. There is no such species on the planet. Why? Because Jesus changes you. He gives you power and desire. Jeremiah said, I will take your heart of stone. This is what God tells us. I will take your heart of stone and I will write my laws on your heart. I will write my desires. Well, I just don't know if I, I can live. You can't help but live it when you meet Jesus. He writes his desires on your heart. He tells you what he wants and you like it. You're not saying, oh, I don't know. If I... Listen, it's harder to live for the devil than it is Jesus when you're saved. He gives a new perspective, a new appetite. Man, when I was lost, I didn't know Jesus. I didn't, I didn't want to go to church. And I sure didn't want to hear anybody talk about Jesus. I pursued the interest in my life that my godless flesh vomited into my life daily. And if someone said, are you a Christian? I'd say, yeah, I'm a Christian. My mama's a Christian. I grew up in a Christian home. I believe the Bible. I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus died for my sins, but I wasn't a Christian. Well, the Bible says all you have to do is, is believe, but it says when you believe, you become new, different. And that is the test. Well, I didn't have the power. Bible says for the Christian, for the person who receives Christ, John chapter 1, verse 12, to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. I have that power in my life. Now, we can all, all of us, I don't care how spiritual you are, you can make the assumption that you have arrived and thereon you will be humbled immediately by the Spirit of God who shows you things in your life and perhaps to others that shows you have not arrived. Hence the word hypocrite. But the difference between a person who sins and a person and, 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 and stays in it 
Is, and a person who's saved is the saved person doesn't want to live in it and wallow in it and roll in it. But as a dog returns to his vomit, so a sinner returns to his ways. When a Christian fails, and I have failed, I'm an authority. When a Christian fails, the Bible says they may fail and fall seven times, but they get up. You keep getting up. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you, and you cannot lie in the dirty grave. You've got to get up. First John 1, 9 says, If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you and forgive you of those sins and restore the joy of your salvation and the power of God in your life. Why? You can't stay in the dirt because you're a new creation. You can't wall around the pigs the rest of your life. Well, you know, we should love them more. We should preach love and gentleness and just let people go to hell. This book is the truth of God. It's called the good news. And the reason that the good news is so good is because the bad news is so bad. And the bad news is you're a sinner. Don't you call me a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a rotten, dirty sinner. But I'm a Baptist. Doesn't matter. You're a sinner. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm a sinner. See, some of you can't do that. Why? Because you're too proud, arrogant. I'm not proud. Yes, you are. Who's the first one you look for when you look at a group picture of you and your friends? It's pride. I want to see me. Where am I? Top row, third row, five over. There I am. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before destruction of the soul, the body, the person. In fact, let me tell you something. The greatest sin in the world wasn't the sin of homosexuality. It's not the, not, not, not the sin of being a murderer. The greatest sin, the, the, the sin that sent the world to hell, the, the sin that brought division in heaven and had Satan cast out with one-third of the angels that now are demons, that sin was the sin of pride. Every sin in my life and your life is built upon the foundation of pride. And until that's dealt with, there will be no re re redemption. Because it means I'm getting off the throne in my life. See, a lot of us, we want Jesus to be Lord, or we want to be the Savior. And then we come along and say, well, you know, I, I made Jesus Savior and, uh, five, uh, 25 years ago, and, 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 and now I'm a, uh, uh, I made him Lord now. No. You make Jesus the Lord of your life at the moment you receive Jesus or you didn't get saved. Now that has to be recommitted every day. Paul said, I don't die every couple of months. I die every day. And it's a reoccurring manifestation of the presence of God in your life as you do that on a daily basis. But you don't get saved unless you come to Jesus with everything. You know, when I came to Christ on the street corner, I, I came spread eagle before the cross, and I said, Lord, I've made those walks down the aisle. I've made those feeble commitments. Well, I know I ought to do not do that. I ought to be better. I've rededicated my life, but you can't rededicate death and flesh and self. The only thing, good, good for, the only thing self is good for is to die. Die. What God wanted me? Drop dead. That's what he wants. Why? Because he has a spirit that will infuse your body and your life, resurrect you, and put you on the path to glory that is glory on the way to glory. It's called salvation. It's called becoming a Christian. It's, bec it's a total surrender of me. But you know what? When the grace of God starts working in that capacity in your life, little by little, the Bible says we get revelation. That means supernatural insight. 
See, the world can't understand that. Why? Because John said we, we understand after we came to Christ and we walked with God, he's, he said, uh, we see the whole world lies in wickedness. We didn't see it before we met Jesus, but now wickedness surrounds us. We're in a world that is inundated in and out and through with wickedness, and it's getting wickeder, as the scriptures say it will, as we go closer to the end times. You have to come to the point in your life where you're saying, God, this is my life no more. I remember the exact words of some, some of the words I said that night when I was on my knees in the middle of a street corner in a dead neighborhood in Houston. I said, Lord, I don't, feel like, I don't feel like there's much left in my life or of my life. But I did say, whatever there is, it's yours. I wish I could tell you that I've always been faithful because I have not. I have failed him many times. But he has always remained faithful even when I wasn't. He was there to hear my confession, to hear my life so, uh, being abandoned again and again and again. And as God gives you revelation, he'll speak to you today things that he didn't talk to you about last week. He'll talk to you things about today that he hadn't said to you ever before. But when he nails it, it's called conviction of the Spirit of God and you don't toy with it and file it away. You bring it fresh to the altar and to the cross and you lay it down and say, God, I am a failure. I cannot do it. But greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And you can do it. Why? Because now I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, a lot of people think getting saved is, well, I got I to gotta quit doing this, and I got to quit doing that, and I'm going to quit drinking, and I'm going to quit smoking. Let me see what else. I'm going to have to quit, you know, doing the nasty things. And when you really meet Jesus, those things aren't important anymore. Oh, yeah, the flesh is there, especially if you've been involved yourself with that before. But the flesh is always going to be taunting you the rest of your life. You never get so spiritual that you don't hear the condemnation of the enemy coming against you and also you listening to him. Yeah. But as you reinspect, I'm almost through. As you re examine, what God has done in your life. If you're a Christian, it's not just what he has done in your life. The question is, what's he doing in your life? Because he is ever present tense. It's good that you got saved 20 years ago, five years ago. But what's God done since then? Very few people understand The power that is resident within the believer. And when we stand before God, I don't promise you Christians something. It's not going to be you worrying about what you did do. You're going to be worried about what you didn't do. When you see the power that was available to us, where each one of us have been given a divine supernatural ability and gifts that have been prostituted today in Christian television and many churches across the land. True, life-changing, supernatural, world-shaking, chain-breaking gifts through the people of God. And they stand before God and they say, what could have been? There's not a person in here that's saved. I don't care how inarticulate you are. I don't care how uneducated you are. I don't care how much of a failure you consider yourself as a human being. If God gets a hold of that life, your life, you will have the power and the ability within you to revolutionize your world and your family. And after all, God doesn't save us to take us to heaven. That's just the byproduct of the process. Why does he save us? He saves us for the purpose of pouring his life through our life. I pray all the time, and I have all my life, that my children would see Jesus in me. 
And I have to confess, they hadn't always seen that. But that's my prayer. That my wife would see Jesus in me. And that hadn't always been the case. But it always come back around. You fail there, Phil. Now get up and go at it again. And each time that I tell somebody about Jesus, each time I preach the, the, the Word of God from a pulpit, each time I get on my knees in my little office and read my Bible and pray in the morning, His life is rendered current in my life. And it's fresh again. And He's all that matters, folks. Of all the cares and the worry and the trouble surrounding each of us, and all of us have problems. Really all that matters is Jesus. And where you stand with him, what your relationship is like. You say, well, I, I think I'm born again. I'm going to give you three or four verses and I'm done. You don't even have to open your Bibles. Too much work for some of us. Too much work for some of us to carry them. They're nice, good leather accessories sitting on top of the TV, but don't ask me to lug that thing to church. Sorry, I know most of you here don't fit in that category. John, first, John. People say, well, I don't know. <laughs> I've had more people tell me, I don't know. I don't know if I, you know, we're going to have to wait till we get to heaven and find out if we're Christians or not. We just don't know. We just do the best we can and hope we make it. Not. John, first John Chapter 2 says this, and by this we do know, what's that word? Know. We do know that we know him. By this we know that we know. How do we know? It says right here, because we keep his commandments. I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about the commandments of the Spirit of God. The spirit of life in Christ that made me free from the law of sin and death. Satan and sin cannot hold me any longer. Because it's all under the feet of Jesus. And as Manly Peasley used to say, there's nothing under the feet of Jesus that's over our head. We know that we know. Some of you say, now you're making me doubt my salvation. I'll tell you something. Some of you need to doubt your salvation. You're lost. Well, I'm not coming back here because you just don't matter. I won't be here either. <laughs> John says we know, and just a, just a few verses over in chapter 3, next chapter, verse 14, it says it again. We know that we have passed. We what? We know. We know that we passed from sin unto death, or from death unto sin, and sin because we love the brethren. I'm not going to go down there to that church and all them thinking hypocrites. Well, come on down. We got room for one more. <laughs> That's such a cop out. A church is not a showcase for saints. It's a place where people, sick people, hurting people, dying people, empty people, go to get changed by the touch of God. That's the church. I dare say every believer in this place today would rather be in a position closer to Christ and closer in their walk with God than they are when they came in this place. Most of you have that kind of Holy Spirit in you, calling out, bearing witness with the Father. Next to the last verse, over in the chapter 5, it said, or chapter 4, chapter 5, verse five, 4 says, and whatsoever is, is, is born, how do you know if you're saved? Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith, our simple casting of ourselves out on the water of God. I may sink, that's okay. I may drown, that's okay. Cast yourself out. He will catch you. And his commitment and his word is good for it. Do you know him? Well, like I said, I, I, I grew up in church. My mother was the greatest Bible teacher even when I was young. And there were six of us, Joe among them. My sister's here today, three of them. 
and another brother, and we were walked every Sunday like little ducks in a line in the church. And we were sat down there, right there. And when I got saved, I had to overcome all that stupidity that I had allowed to sink into my head that because I'm a Christian or because I'm a church member or because I got baptized, because I went to a camp and made a commitment or because I prayed at the altar one time, that I was a Christian and I was not. Because none of these things were real in my life. None of them. And I looked at my life. I was in Las, I was in Las Vegas a few weeks before I came to back to Houston and got saved. And I was up there in Caesar's Palace in about the 15th floor. Went into a room. Everybody had been partying. And I went up to the room because I was just tired of looking at all the tinsel and people. And everywhere I looked, there were people with everything who had nothing. Empty shells trying to get a smile on their face with more liquor or more drugs or more whatever. Oh, and they got one, but it goes away so quick. And I said to myself, something's wrong, and I went up to my room, and I sat on the bed, and I just opened the drawer to see what was in there while I was moping around, and there was a Gideon Bible there, and I pulled that Gideon Bible out, and it fell open to the verse that I gave you. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things passed away, all things become new. I wasn't a scholar of the Bible, but I knew enough to how to read. And I said, if that's true, then I'm wrong because I've never had old things pass away and all things become new. I never saw it from God's perspective. And when you get saved, among other things, you get God's perspective. And it's a lot easier to preach to people who understand they got a problem. I used to spend a lot of times in the bars after I was saved. It's a lot easier to preach in the bars than it is most churches. I mean, people in the bar, they know they got a problem. got to be the will, the audacity, the courage, the guts to step off the throne and say, God, I am undone. I am so worthless. And that's what I did on the street corner that night. And I just felt the peace of God flow over me like melted butter. And the first time in my life, ever, in 22, three years, for the first time in my life, I felt clean. Clean. There's been many times since I've gotten a little smudge on me, but I know where to go with it. Run to the cross. Call out to God. And let him restore you. I, I, I don't know all these people. I know some of you uh, here today, and uh, others I don't. But you can tell a Christian when you come across them when you see them in church even in dim lights. Why? Because their countenance, as Jeremiah said, their countenance shows who they are. Their countenance is just a light. They're just a light. It's not the darkness and not the, not the shadow of death that sits upon those who've rejected God's will, God's way, and God's terms. You have a choice what are you going to do with your life? Some of you say, well, I'm just going to get right with God someday. I'm going to do it. No, you won't. You do it when God says now, or you don't do it. Amen. And in Romans 1, it says, and God spoke to them repeatedly. He declared himself in the heavens. He declared his word. He declared it through his prophets. He declared it through the cross. He declared it through the, through the spirit of God. 
preaching his truth. He's declared it. But that they would not listen, and it says three times, people say, well, God loves everybody. He would never give anybody up. The Bible says in Romans three times, he gave them up to the wantonness of their own lives. God will walk away, never talk to you again. You better value, you better treasure. Anytime you hear the voice of God touch you in any way, you better grasp it with all you can. And pray for the grace of God. Can we pray? Can we bow our heads? Close our eyes.